And last but definitely not least, we have the number three ranked UFC light heavyweight contender in the world and the other half of our main event, Anthony Smith. Anthony, thanks for joining us, sir. Man, I don't know why you got to say it like that. I always just point out that I'm late. <laughs> How are you guys doing? We're happy to see you, Anthony. Um, I'm happy to be here, man. Kicking off the first question is going to be James Lynch from The Score. James, please go ahead. My man. Hey, Anthony, how's it going? Uh, good to talk to you. Uh, I'm sure you're thrilled that this fight was rebooked, um, but you know you were going to be fighting in your home state in Nebraska, and now you're fighting in front of no fans in an empty arena. Mentally, how different is the preparation for this fight knowing that? Um, you know, you just got to figure out how, how to kind of like move your, your programming around a little bit just because more of the date that messed it up. But obviously I had to kind of get out of my feelings a little bit and, and back up and, and just... You know, you got to realize that the, this isn't anybody's fault, but you can't help but feel like, you know, what is it going to take? Like, uh, you know, I've been busting my balls for over a decade trying to get to a point where I could headline a UFC event in my home state. But, you know, it's just you can't help it. You know, it's just the world is the way it is. There's a lot of people that are going through a lot worse things. So it's it does sound very silly of me to complain about something like that because I'm still able to compete. Um, I'm still able to do what I do, what I love for a living. Uh, and support my family doing that so uh, at some point I had to check my ego uh, and just back up and just be fortunate for what I do have and what I can do You almost need to add another fight on your record with the home invasion you had recently and I know there was a really scary situation of what happened um, you know when this all occurred I know you weren't sure what was happening with the fight but was there ever a thought of not fighting perhaps just with something as you know pretty uh, scary as, as that situation no not really man uh, that's just not me uh, you know, the UFC reached out and, and, and made it clear that, that they were okay if that was something I wanted to do and just focus on my family. But this is not me, man. I mean, I, would, I really, would I really be Lionheart if, if I let something like that put me in a position where I'm going to back out of my, my previous, you know, responsibilities and things? You know, like, I say I'm going to show up, I'm going to show up. Uh, that does, there's no contingencies there. So I'm going to show up if everything's perfect or if nothing goes wrong with it. I'm going to be here, uh, and, and I'm not going to let some, you know, some psychopath dictate uh, what I do and what I don't do. You know, I'm going to keep on pushing forward. It's what I, I tell my kids every day because they're still having problems. Like, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other, and we'll just deal with it day by day. And how much training did you get at Factory X for this camp? Just because I know the travel restrictions, it's, it's pretty hard to get around. Uh, you know, what, what sort of camp have you had leading into this fight? Uh, well, I was doing a longer camp anyways because I'd been out for so long. Uh, so fortunately, I did do that. Uh, I started way early. Uh, I did the first three weeks in Kansas City with James Krause. I did the following three weeks uh, in Denver with Mark. And then that's kind of when the, the, the whole world kind of shut down. So then the rest of the time I've been uh, uh, in, in Omaha. But I've, I've got my work in with, with Mark and James. So Mark left on Friday. James left Omaha Thursday, uh, so you know I've, I've I've been able to get my work in with them still. And I'm guessing no training with Ian Heinish. I know he's he's sort of left the gym. He's he's going to be training in Thailand now. I imagine you didn't get to work with him at all. No, no, not at all. Ian was already was already gone. Okay, gotcha. And last question, uh, you know, big fight, main event. Um, you know, Glover's a really you know he's a tough guy to finish, but obviously the landscape of the division right now. Do you feel like a finish would sort of put you in that mix right now because it's obviously very crowded at the top. Uh, you know, outside of John Jones. Yeah, man, there's a, there's nowhere to sit down at top that, at the top of the division. That's for sure, man. It's standing room only up there. Um, you know, I think I think a dominant performance and a, and a finishing over over Glover would. I think it puts me in a position to uh, to fight whoever doesn't get the title shot. You know, and and listen, I mean, I'm a realist. Uh, I know that I didn't have the best performance against John, and and I'm gonna have to earn my way back to it. But I think that. You know, if Reyes gets the title shot, I think fighting either uh, Tiago Santos or Jan Blachowicz, I think that a win over one of those guys uh, absolutely puts me right back uh, into a title fight. Thanks for the time, Anthony. Appreciate it. No worries, buddy. Sorry for leaving you hanging. And next up, we have Luis Green from MMA Crazy. Please go ahead. Luis Green! My girl! Oh, she left. Damn it. Luis, do we have you? He's gone. Got sick of waiting on me. Damn, I was really hoping to see Luis Green. We'll circle back with her for now. Let's move on to the next one. Damon Martin. Damon, are you ready? Hey, what's going on, buddy? How are you? 
All right, man. I, just so you know, I'm just as excited to talk to you as Louise Green. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, we've talked. Tra- talked obviously numerous times uh between the fight cancellations the home invasion obviously so you're probably sick of talking to me at this point but two days away from a fight can you kind of put in context the chaotic nature of these last like two months of your career coming to this point i mean i couldn't i mean when it's all said and done you got a book to write basically out of just these last couple of months yeah that's been crazy man uh, you know just even starting at the handbrake you know like I break my hand. I'm all begging for. I mean, and look, look, look how stupid I look now. I was begging for for time off uh, before I fought Gus. Like I, after you know, like the even the two or three fights previous, I was saying, man, I need a break. I need some time off. I need a break. You know, and then I like you know, it's just like that's just typical. You know, then I break my hand, uh, and then I'm out forever. You know, and then I have the second surgery, and then they have to take the bone from my leg. You know, and then I finally start getting back to it. You know, I wanted to fight and everywhere you're like beginning of march but i had to push that all the way back because i wanted to still headline in nebraska uh so then we pushed it all the way back to april then the pandemic happens and then you know douchebag in my house and and this shit's just been crazy man so i think later on down the road i think you're right man i think we probably do have a a pretty cool book uh to get out how much does your experience and being a veteran and going through what you've gone through in your career prepare? I mean, nothing can prepare you for what you've gone through, but I mean, do you feel like that has been a help that you have so much experience that you've been able to prepare knowing, you know, two different, three different fight dates potentially, you know, you always had the same opponent, but again, that even wasn't guaranteed. I mean, there's no guarantee what was going to happen. So, I mean, do you feel like that did help you, uh, that experience to deal with all kind of the craziness of this, uh, this situation? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I think just being kind of a, a grizzled veteran, uh, you know, and I think Glover's in the same position. That, that I think we're able to deal with stuff like this a little bit easier. Like, we didn't, neither one of us kind of came up in the golden era uh, of, of MMA, you know. Like, you know, I've said this before, like, fighting in an empty arena uh, in Jacksonville, Florida is not going to be the weirdest place I've ever fought. So, it, that's it's just kind of par for the course for the beginning of my career you know like it wasn't as pretty and as sanctioned and as and as put together as it is now so um you know we've kind of just been there and done that and and you know this is and, and even now going through the whole process now that i'm here this is this is way better than anything i ever did at the beginning of my career so this isn't even that bad so <laughs> i know i mean like the situations are kind of crazy but i was still able to get my training camp in i was still got like, really really good working at home i, I i'm Physically, I feel better than I felt in a really, really long time. Uh, I'm sharp. My conditioning is good. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm not too banged up. Like I'm not sore. Uh, and mentally, I'm in a good spot. I mean, I couldn't. Have, you could really. I mean, I don't know how much more you could ask for. You know. Yeah. You talked openly about you know fighting with a bit of a chip on your shoulder when you know people try to take away some of your biggest wins by talking about the other guy. You know, when you beat Shogun, it was well. You know, that's not the Shogun that was champion and so on and so forth. And when you fought Gus right after he retires, and you know, it doesn't take away the victory, but, you know, obviously, you know, when a guy retires like that, it does kind of take away the shine a little bit. Uh, Glover's a guy who's a veteran, fought for the title, and obviously been out there. But in a way, do you, do you kind of in a way do you kind of enjoy having that chip on your shoulder? Because it seems like you're always out there with something to prove. Yeah, you know, I think I've always kind of fought like that, you know. And, and I think it's I, – I don't, I don't drink my own – I don't drink my own Kool-Aid, you know, like I don't believe my own hype. So I think a lot of it is I'm always trying to prove something to myself. Uh, you know, like I think sometimes, it, to be honest with you, there's, there's a lot of times where I kind of feel like I don't belong. You know, like I, I just sometimes it's shocking that I'm still here or that I've made it to this point. So it's it's always that. But it, it, it leaves me with this feeling of, of, of having to grind and continue to earn it and continue to push forward. Because I, I shouldn't be here. You know, I, I shouldn't be in this position. I'm a small-town Nebraska dude that didn't have shit going for him. And I, you know, I didn't even graduate high school. You know, like, what, what? sometimes it's like, what the fuck am I doing here? So I need to keep earning that and keep working towards that and keep making sure that, that no one's going to take that from me. So I think that that's where the chip comes from. Um, it's making sure that I'm doing everything to stay here. And my last question, Anthony, now that you are, you know, one of those media folks as well on the side when you're not fighting, uh, but also the 
light heavyweight division, everything that happens in this division does affect you because, as you mentioned, if you go out there and be Glover, there's only so many options in front of you as far as opponents go. So I want to get your opinion. If you play matchmaker right now, like, do you believe it should be Jones Reyes too, or, or in your mind, do you think maybe Jones will hope which makes more sense because it is a fresh matchup? If you're playing uh, Joe Silver or in this case now Mick Maynard or Sean Shelby, what what matchup do you think makes the most sense for that time? Um, you know, I guess for me. Uh, is when it, when you when you start talking about what makes sense, uh, I don't really know what makes more what, what makes sense because I guess I'm not the the UFC, so I don't know like financially what does that look like timeline what does that look like like the, I think there's a lot of things that go into that. But who do I think deserves it? I think I as much as it pains me to say it, uh, I think Dominic Reyes deserves a rematch. Uh, I think that he he did everything he's supposed to do. He, he went out there, he busted his ass. Uh, and gave John all he could handle it. And, and I think that if you ask 10 people, I think the majority of those people would say that, that John Jones lost that fight. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, I, I, I think Jan Blachowicz equally, well, maybe not equally, but he, he also deserves a title shot, you know. But I just, I think Reyes' claim to it is a little bit stronger, you know. Like, Blachowicz has a win over Rockhold, you know. Like, Rockhold hasn't won since... Have to, you know, like there's 25ers in the division that haven't ever seen Luke Rockhold win a fight before, so it's been a while since that guy's done that. Um, you know, and, 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 he, and he lost to Tiago Santos, who's also floating around up there. So uh, he does have a good win over Corey Anderson. I will give him that. But uh, I think the way the Reyes went in there and did what he did, I think that he he had something stolen from him uh, by the commission. You know, and I think that he at least deserves the opportunity to right that wrong. And, and I also don't think that he will win the rematch. Uh, I think that was the best Dominic Reyes. I think that's all he has to offer. Uh, I think that's as good as it gets. Uh, and I think John Jones tends to do better uh, in rematches. And I don't think Reyes left anything in the tank for later. I think that, that I think he emptied the tank, and that's all he's got. Thanks, Anthony. Appreciate it, as always. No worries. Stay in touch. And up next, we'll have Mike Bond from Rolling Stone. Mike, please go ahead. Up, Anthony, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Um, well, thanks. Um, I'm interested to know you just said uh, a few minutes ago there that you know <laughs> you're feeling really good and everything. Everything can be you know going better. We spoke a couple of weeks ago. You admitted you were feeling a little run down, a little beat up. At what point did you kind of turn the corner and start feeling you know really good again? Uh, when we started shortening the the you know as you get to towards the end of a camp. Um, all the meat and potatoes were like, like right when I talked to you, we were like just getting towards the, the end of like, you know, the suck when it's just really, really tough and really hard and, and your coaches are assholes and they don't give you a break and, and you just, you know, it's, <laughs> they're sitting over there. That's why I said that. Uh, but I, I was right in that suck, you know, where you just grinding and you got to put your head down and no one really cares how you feel. Then you start moving on to where you, the training sessions are a little bit shorter uh, not a whole lot, but a little bit. The contact uh, comes down a lot, so there's not as much impact. You're not, you know, not getting your legs banged up, and uh, so you just slowly start to heal. Uh, and then the conditioning part of it ramps up. So you're doing a lot of conditioning stuff, a lot of fast pace, low impact uh, type of training. So then I just, you just start to slowly heal, and that's kind of how the peaking process works. Gotcha. And you also said when we spoke that uh, you were going to submit Glover. That's what you're aiming for. No one has ever done that before. I asked him about it. He basically said, bring it on. Uh, you know, he welcomes that challenge. Do you still feel this close to the fight? That's how it ends? I mean, yeah, I think it can. Uh, don't think for a second that if I get a hold of Glover's neck, he won't go to sleep. Uh, and, and, and obviously, uh, Glover and I have tremendous, tremendous respect for each other. But he jokes around, and you can see the smirk in his face when he's doing those interviews. He knows just as well as, as I do that if he slips... I will catch him, and he knows that. Uh, we have mutual training partners. We have mutual friends. We know some of the same people. He knows it, and I know it. And I, on the on the flip side of that, I know that if I slip, Glover can catch me. We're just two high level dudes. But uh, I mean, if I could, that would be a nice feather in my cap to be to be the first guy to get you know to catch him in a submission. Absolutely. And last question from me. Uh, you mentioned talking about the matchmaking of the division a little bit, a possibility of a Tiago Santos rematch if you look at your twitter profile your pinned tweet is still 
the post fight from that night, February 3rd, 2018. Uh, is there something about that particular loss? Obviously, you, know, you moved up to light heavyweight since and everything, but that you still keep it on there to remind you of, and would there be something special to having that fight back? Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, oh, man, I, you know, I guess to, the, to everyone else, Tiago's the, you know, he's the two-headed fire-breathing dragon, but uh, Tiago is like, I don't know. It's like my mirror, kind of. Uh, I, I keep that tweet there because that was one of the lowest moments of my career, you know. I, I and I'm better than that. Uh, you know, there's circumstances, and and sometimes things just don't go your way. You know, it does it just doesn't. It just sometimes it just falls. The cards fall the other direction. So, uh, but that's absolutely a fight that I want, uh, and that's absolutely a fight that I don't think anyone else is asking me for. So. I think that that's the that's going to be that that uh, go back and look at my career when I got cut from the UFC in 2013. Um, my first fight outside of the UFC was Josh Near. Uh, it was a catchweight at 175 uh, in the main event in BFC Council Bluffs, Iowa. Josh Near finished me in the fourth round. Uh, I changed a whole lot of things. Uh, I focused on getting better. I changed my mindset. I won eight in a row. Uh, to get back to the UFC, and on the eighth fight, I capped it off, and I finished Josh Near in under a minute. So uh, that's that's how my brain works. Like I'll come back to that. You know what I mean? Like I'll I had the fight, and it went the way that it went with Tiago, but I know that I'm better than that, and I know that I can beat him, uh, and I know that that that's what the fans want to see, and I'll and I'll circle back to that. And after that fight, I changed a lot of things, and I got a lot better, and I focused on a lot, and I changed my mindset, and we'll circle back to that, and it'll be. It'll be my, my next Josh Near moment. Yeah, and I remember going into that Near fight, we did an interview, and you said your your biggest motivation was to prove something to Joe Silva going into that fight. Do, do you recall that as well? I do. Yeah, I do. And because, you know, that's that's kind of, Joe Silva was very was very much that's what I'm looking for here. He was very he was very open about how he felt about people. And you know, he was very he made it very clear that he didn't think I was ready. Uh, to be back, you know, and I, I'd beaten every top prospect in the entire country. I'd taken every title that was available on in, 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 on the regional scene. Like I didn't know what else I had to do. And, and circling back to that, Josh Near was a very it was it's a very easy gauge of where I was and where I am now. You know, like at, at least at that time, like here's where I was when he beat me. I won all these fights. I won all these titles. I beat all these dudes that you said that were ready for the UFC, and then I beat him. Uh, and took those titles, and then and then we circled back to Josh, and then th it was very easy to see how much better I had gotten in that, you know, in that two year span or whatever it was. Um, and that's you know that's kind of how my <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but that's just you know if I if I have a failure, I'll try to fix it. I'll do the best I can, and I'll circle back and I'll do it again. Did you ever hear from Joe these days? What what do you think he thinks of you now? I don't know. I don't know. I I I, I would be curious. Uh, I'm sure Joe still watches fights, and, and he he's. He's a he's a fight junkie, man. So uh, I would be curious to know, though. For sure, awesome. Appreciate that, Dave. Best of luck. Thanks, man. Take care. And next up, we have Mike Heck from MMA Fighting. Mike, please go ahead. Hey, how are you, man? Um, I feel like we're getting very reflective here with this conversation because, and I'm not trying to link you with John Jones, but. With everything you've said, I think people say that there should be a 30 for 30 about John Jones and what happened throughout his career. And to me, I think an Anthony Smith 30 for 30 or a documentary would be equally, if not more fascinating, considering what you have gone through in your career. Like, I know you're focused on Glover and the task at hand, but do you find yourself, like, in reflective points, thinking back on your career, like getting that short notice call back with the UFC? Now you're about to headline your fifth consecutive event. You've had a title fight with John Jones. You're not a braggadocious guy, but do you allow yourself to reflect back on that and, and just feel grateful about it because it's really an impressive story? Uh, it happens in, in, in really short, really short spurts, and, and it tends to happen when I'm, it's, it's kind of those dad moments, you know, where we'll be at the lake or, or up in the mountains riding razors or fishing or out, of my, out at the farm or, or whatever, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll just be kind of off in the cut and watching my family kind of just doing their thing. Um, those are kind of the moments that it happens where I'm, you know, I've, like I've created this life 
uh, for them, or at least, or at least the opportunity. You know, I've, I've given them the opportunity to to live freely and do whatever they want, uh, and, and to not ever worry about anything. Or what in the world is that? There we go. Uh, yeah, I, I've given them, you know, the the freedom to do that, and and that's something I'm really proud of. That uh, it's down to little shit, man. It's it's like like to me. Pumping gas and not looking at how much it costs is a luxury, you know? Like, it just wasn't always like that. Um, just just little stuff like that. Like, I'm grateful for little things, you know? And just paying the mortgage and not worrying about it, you know? Like, just little stuff and, and the freedom to, to be at all my kids' events whenever I need to be because I don't, I don't have to work at 9 to 5 like a lot of people do. So, it's just, just moments like that. I'm super grateful, but I, I feel like if you sit down too long, uh, it, it makes it hard to get up, and and I don't want to sit down and reflect. I'll, I can do that uh, when I'm all done. And then uh, last, last thing for me, if you go back and talk to the 2013 Anthony Smith, what would you say to him? Because it seemed like everything sort of worked out the way you had hoped for anyways, but if you could go back and tell that guy something, even at the sort of the darkest point of that year, what would you say to him? I would tell him that he was right, probably. Uh I was doing a lot of bullshitting back in those days. Uh, it's kind of one of those fake it till you make it moments. Like I was saying the right things and, and it's like I was talking myself into it, but the, I didn't actually know if I was going to make it or not. I had no idea. You know, I'd fought up to that point to make it to the UFC. I made it a, about three minutes in my UFC career and blew my knee. So like, I didn't actually know if I'd, if I'd make it back. But if you asked me, I'd have told you straight up out loud, like I'm going to do this shit and I'm going to be at the top of the world. But deep down, I didn't. I didn't actually know. So I would probably just like, you know, tell him he's right. Like you'll be, you'll be fine. Awesome. Thanks, Anthony. Good luck. Thanks, man. And that is all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Anthony. Hey, no worries, man. You take care of yourself.